This class deals with cognitive learning. Um, cognitive learning deals with the mind. It's different to behavioralism. Behavioralism was a situation where uh, Pavlov's dog heard the bell and salivated. The dog anticipated food. So every time the dog heard the bell, the dog was rewarded with food. Eventually, when the dog heard the bell, it just salivated. It was prepared. It was conditioned. So it was almost non-thinking. It was an automatic response. Cognitive learning is about the mind. And we try to consider what are the uh, issues involved in cognitive learning by listing out the type of uh, ways in which we acquire knowledge and acquire information. It's about how we think. And we, ha we get insights into ourselves from trying to find out how do we think, how do we think in different situations. Very big question and the subject of a lot of research. How do we perceive the world around us? How do we see the world in which we live? How do we understand the world around us? And we use logic to solve problems. <clears throat> we know uh, principles in mathematics and we have principles in logic, in reasoning and we use these to solve problems. But sometimes the world is, is more complex. It's, uh, it's not clear-cut and we have to make sense of that. We're also, in, let's say in the context of business, we're trying to look into the future. What will the future demand for the product be or should we invest in the machine now and have a return in the future? We're, we're trying to anticipate the future and we try to use logical thinking and uh, different approaches to try and predict and help us to think. We, we constantly use trial and error. We, we experiment almost. We, we think we need to find a solution to this. We don't know how to do it, but we'll try this. And if it fails, we'll learn from the experience. Then we'll try something else. And eventually we will get to a situation where we found a solution. Sometimes if logic fails us or if we don't completely understand the situation we, we might use trial and error to try and get an insight into what's happening and trying to solve the problem by almost by experimentation. So it's how do we learn? How do we best learn? We might learn from our experiences, we might learn from books. It depends on the type of problems we're trying to solve. If there are problems in higher mathematics, then experimentation and experiences, the chances are, are not going to be a great deal of help to us. So we're going to look at uh, books and libraries and research papers and academic work. In business, it may be more experiential. We, we try to learn from our experiences, make sense of what happened and try to work out if similar, similar situations arise in the future, what is the best course of action. We, we try to identify problems and find solutions. Uh, we're constantly on the lookout for issues that can go wrong. Even when everything is going right, we, we try to anticipate what could go wrong and we try to have solutions ready. And this cuts across everything just about. Uh, when uh, when new, new offices are opened, nicely designed, perhaps recently constructed, they will still have safety precautions built in. Just in case we're trying to identify the problems. The building could go on fire. If it does, what's the solution? How do we get people out? So we, we factor in solutions to problems that don't exist at the moment. We're trying to identify the problems and solve them in advance. Now, cognitive learning theory, well, the concept of cognitive learning theories 
are reliant on human thought processes. These are inside our heads. These are how we, we try to make sense of the world. This is how we, uh, we take in information and try to make sense of it. We take in, really, we take in data and then we refine it in our heads and turn it into information, turn it into what we understand. So the type of information and, and the type of data that we're taking in and, and working with could be related to our perception, how we see the world. And how we see it would be different from each person, from our depending on our backgrounds, our education, our experiences. So we have different perceptions. And we have to recognize that we, we have different perceptions. That's what makes us different as individuals. And cognition. How do we understand what we see? How do we make sense of what we see? And how do we make sense of our experiences? How do we make sense of um, what's happening around us? And how can we rationalize what's happening around us? How do we think about situations? How do we think about problems? We use our memory. We're constantly feeding information into our memory. We have worked out solutions to problems and we file it away in our memory. So if a similar situation arises in the future, we extract the information from the previous one, from our memory, and we apply it. So we have memories that are our accumulated experiences. And we can draw on these to, to try and make sense of situations. We have got logical capacity. We, we do understand relationships. We do understand uh, that uh, certain things happen before something else. Uh, we understand that these might be uh, technical relationships. In, in a working environment, for example, uh, the raw material must be in place before it can be processed into the final output. That's a very basic understanding, but there is a logic in that. that. One thing must come before the other. There are also social logical connections. Uh, if we go to the restaurant, we have the meal and then we pay. Generally speaking, we don't pay before we've had the meal. There is a, a sequence. And we understand the logic, why this is the case. Uh, why are situations connected? How do we, uh, how do we understand the, the system in place in a company? Is by looking at the various logical connections. Uh, if there's some parts of the system that a company is using, let's say a manufacturing system, that doesn't smoothly fit into the next one, there may be a failing in logic, a failing in understanding of the sequencing that's required or the processing that's required or, or some aspect of the job. So we use all the time, we use logic. And we structure information. We, we, we don't just file it away in our memory, we structure it. This comes under uh, machinery that breaks down. If the car breaks down, this comes under car breakdowns. And we structure the information. That, that information goes into our car breakdown part of our memory. We structure information about uh, people and about relationships at work in the sense of uh, the bureaucracy and who relates to who and, and the passage of work through the organization and, and how the people deal with this. We, we look at the structure, we understand our own structure, the way we structure knowledge in our heads. So we have it for easy recall. And we also try to make a structure of what we see. We try to understand more holistically what we see. We try to understand the whole system. We try to understand what it's trying to do. We try to understand its constituent parts and how they all link and fit together and what the outcome is. And a cognitive person, a person who is a thinking person, 
will be doing this automatically. Cognitive theorists use these processes to explain how individuals obtain, process and preserve information. So we have different ways of acquiring the information and processing the information. So the concept of this theory revolves on the idea of the whole, the whole thing, the whole business, the whole, the whole structure. And then we can go looking for the individual components and look at the logic of how the different parts fit together and who does what and, and how the, 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 the product is processed or, or how the outcome is, is developed. So we're looking at the whole organization, we're looking at the whole uh, situation. And then we try to find out what the, if you like, the micro parts do and how they fit. We identify a situation and experience our information as a whole. Generally speaking, we don't get half an experience, we get an experience. Half an experience we would still treat as an experience because that's all we know, that's what we've got. There may be parts missing, but that's not our fault. We, we try to understand the whole system. If that information is not available, we try to understand what we've got. And that becomes the whole for us. Only later we might find there are other parts missing that now have come to light. We begin to organize our thoughts and ideas towards resolving the situation. So we're, we're constantly uh, trying to get a deeper understanding for different situations, different experiences. We're trying to understand them in a more complete form. We internalize the solution and its methodology in order to broaden our spectrum. When it's internalized, it becomes a part of us. We have a deep understanding of a situation. We internalize the situation. It's now inside of us. We understand the logic. We understand the processes. We understand what's going on. We have a deep understanding of the situation. So we've, we've internalized it. When that happens, we have clear pictures and we are fluent in that particular topic. We understand that experience completely. And once we've got a situation which is internalized, <coughs> we can adapt this to future situations. Similar situations, if they arise in the future, similar experiences occur, we can understand them because we've come across something that's very similar and we've got a deep understanding of that particular situation so we can look at the new situation and try to understand it. Uh, Cutler uh, in 1925 observed uh, looking at the mentality of apes and got a, uh, a significant insight into how we learn and the process of information by, by studying apes. We often learn from the animal kingdom. We learn from animals quite a lot. We get greater insights into our own behavior. Here the, <coughs> the apes uh, using different tactics and tools and strategies to obtain fruit that was beyond their reach. And this pattern was observed in other animals. They, they were problem solvers. They, they wanted to get the particular fruit but they couldn't reach it so they used implements. Now that was a big breakthrough. We, we used to think that humans were the only people who used tools. We were the only creatures who used tools. But we now know that an octopus can use tools. An octopus is a problem solver. We know that birds can solve problems to get uh, access to food as well. It's not just us. We are uh, a planet of problem solvers. We, we think about situations and sometimes we think laterally. We think uh, we want the outcome, we want the food in the case of the apes or in the case of 
an octopus who wants to solve a problem or a bird who wants to get an access to some food. We want to solve the problem, but we can't solve it just on our own. We need tools. We need to think about what the solution is. It's a cognitive process. Kotler uh, implied that there is a, a generic memory that allows the apes to retrieve existing knowledge. So we have we have a, a memory which stores up observations and experiences and and previous thinking on situations. And this memory holds uh, solutions or indications or clues as to how to solve the current problem. So we have this, if you like, generic memory. We have this wide memory full of experiences and full of observations which we carry around with us. It's part of our it's part of, our, of us. It, it's in our heads. And when we have a problem to solve we dip into this to try and pull out an appropriate solution. Piaget, in 1971, extended the notion. He, he noted that the mental process, processing of new information, embeds into our existing knowledge. So whenever we have an experience, a new experience, we don't kick out old experiences. We, we take in the new experience and we process it. We look at why it's a new experience and how does it fit with our previous experiences. So we accommodate this new information. And that's quite a radical way of looking at it because we have a stock of experiences in our heads, in our memory, and when we have a new experience we take it in and Sometimes it may be at variance, it may be different to what we've got already there from our previous experiences. Now what we need to do is we need to think about it, we need to rationalize it, and we need to accommodate it. Sometimes our old experiences, of course, were, uh, were not good. We, we hadn't rationalized them correctly, we hadn't thought about them correctly, or, or the experience itself was um, not accurately observed or experienced, in that case we would have to kick it out, we'd have to clear it out of our memory if we can. It was, if you like, a silly notion we had, a silly idea we had, but now we've learned something better. But for many cases, uh, the new experience goes on top of the previous experience and we accommodate it, we, we integrate it into our thinking. So Piaget introduced this concept of a simulation, accommodation, and equilibrium. We have uh, three ideas here that give us an insight into how we think. And if we look at these, if we just start here with the, the learning process here at the top, I'll just put the cursor onto the screen. If we start here with the learning process at the top, then we learn a new piece of information. We we have a new experience or something something new happens to us which is the the learning a new piece of information this process here now we assimilate this we we bring this in here into the simulation box and we incorporate this new information with our existing information which is our accommodation so we've we have a new piece of information we assimilate the new piece of information and then we accommodate it, we, we fit it in with our previous experiences. So we, over here we, we integrate um, the assimilation and accommodation to develop a new structure, a new way of thinking. So we've, we've put the two together, well, we've got a new way of thinking. This we call equilibrium. Equilibrium refers to a state of balance between assimilation and accommodation. So we've, it's an equilibrium between what we believe to be for and our new understanding, our new experience. So we haven't, 
as I said earlier, we haven't kicked out our old experiences. We've kept our old experiences. We've added new experience on top, and we've accommodated that, and now we've struck a, a balance between the two. So now we have a much richer understanding of situations. And this new equilibrium becomes what we what we think and what we do. And in future, if we learn something new again, this new situation here, the, the, the new information will become assimilated with this and accommodated with this, and there'll be yet another new equilibrium further along. Now, the implication for trainers, well, the individual's ability to solve problems is important to facilitate learning. So it's important that uh, our capacity to solve problems is, is recognized and developed. And we learn from solving problems. Uh, at school, we learn mathematics by solving mathematical problems. We, we learn to think logically. We, we solve problems through having different experiences and drawing on the experiences the next time round. We, we solve the problem. So problem solving is important. It facilitates learning. Raven introduced the idea of discovery learning. Now this form of learning, the learners are in charge of their own learning. So in this case, uh, discovery learning is when people learn from their own activities. They, they, they learn what they want to learn and get themselves the experiences that they want. They decide what they need to learn rather than follow a set cu uh, curriculum. Uh, discovery learning is good for perhaps hobbies and lifestyles. But in terms of industry, having the workers uh, and the employees only engage in the activities that interest them and only uh, learning what they want to learn is a bit luxurious. It's a bit uh, uh, overdone. We all have to take on tasks that don't give us maximum pleasure or experiences or uh, give us positive reinforcement or enjoyment. We all have to do things that uh, we just have to do them. We hope that on balance the majority of our work is interesting and uh, we, we get engrossed in it. But sometimes we come across tasks that are not so pleasant. Now discovery learning would say well we ignore those and just pick what we want to learn and we learn best by being positively motivated to do the bits that we want to do. And for some parts of our lives that is absolutely true. Uh, our hobbies, for example, we, we only want to do the bits that give us positive pleasure, interest. If we have a hobby that uh, is annoying us and uh, upsetting us and hard work and boring and it wouldn't be a hobby, we would simply drop it. Trainers need to become facilitators, the guide learners. Let them explore the learning possibilities. Again, uh, not applicable in all situations, I would have thought. Uh, if the workers are experimenting and learning by doing, that may be at the cost of the business. And if the raw materials are very expensive, having workers simply experiment and trying out new ideas using raw materials and machinery and time and valuable resources may not be a good idea. So for most companies, the, the trainers become facilitators, but they are much more interventionist. They, they show the, uh, the employees how to perform the tasks, what is good practice. They learn from experience, and then they, they support the, the workers in their efforts to emulate what they said was, was good practice. Now the implications for trainers. Well, a trainer's role is to develop their learners. 
help them process the information and then embeds into their long-term memory. So the trainer has got a, a vital role in influencing the way people see situations. The trainer gives them experiences, uh, gives them scenarios, roles, role plays with them or sets up situations where the, the learners have the experiences which they can incorporate into their memory and draw upon it when required. It embeds into their long-term memory and when situations arise in the future they can recall from the long-term memory and they are better equipped to solve the problem. Cognitive learning involves the following memory tests and other psychometric experiments. So often it's the case that cognitive learning will be tested by various uh, psychometric experiments and the efficiency of various learning programs can be measured or at least trainers and psychologists can attempt to measure by looking at these psychometric tests. It's not a precise science. Uh, the person undertaking the test may have a toothache or be distracted in some way by some family issue or problem coming to work that morning had an accident in the car or whatever so it's not a precise science uh, but it may be an indicator so the learning could be tested um, or there's an opportunity to test under uh, under various restrictions. Uh, the person undertaking the test uh, will presumably engage in the test but the person who is using the test should be aware that there may be circumstances which mitigate or which uh, go against the findings. So realism has to prevail. Um, cognitive learning could involve case study and project work that's often the case. Uh, case studies are situations where uh, com companies may, may uh, use case studies to see if um, particular parts of management for example have an awareness of wider issues and are able to incorporate the knowledge from the case study and make sense of it. Uh, using models and ideas which were, were uh, gained from other experiences of other, other times. So case studies and project work is is a good way of, of looking at understanding. Formative assessments well, these are assessments which are given to the uh, people on courses which are not taken into account. They're just they're there to help the person measure their own progress. So at the end of some activity and looking at the learning outcomes that were required from that activity there might be a formative test. Uh, it's, uh, it's a test given to, to the, uh, the people to see if they, they understand what they are doing. Mind mapping is just looking at uh, their core understanding of what's happening and look at all of the peripheral bits if you like, all the peripheral experiences that are feeding in uh, perhaps from other experiences in the past or uh, from situations that are current to the, the current experience and which could influence the outcomes of the current experience. So mind mapping is looking at all the relevant information and all the relevant data to try and make sense of the situation and just writing it all down to see if they connect and to see in what ways they connect and why they connect. It could be that uh, trainers require trainees to make presentations. Perhaps having had some training in an area they ask the participants to do a presentation. In other words 
uh, explain what they understood happened or apply the, the knowledge they gained from the training experience in a slightly different way to solve a slightly different problem. And problem solving activities, well these are ubiquitous, these are constantly used. Um, once the experience has been delivered in the training session, once the competency has been developed, once the skill has been uh, shown, then ask the person to apply it in solving a particular problem. Now let's look at the advantages uh, of the cognitive learning approach. It's a scientific approach. There is a considerable amount of evidence um, that has been collected from research and a considerable amount of research for that matter has been conducted in the area. So it is a, a testable area and as, as such it is attractive and we get deeper understanding and deeper insights into it as an approach because of the research that's conducted. It can be applied with behaviorism um, to gain a, a better perception in human behavior and development. So it doesn't exclude behaviorism. Um, it, it may augment it. Uh, it there is nothing to, to say that uh, the, the approach of the behavioralist uh, which looks at, uh, let's say, classical conditioning, um, back to Pavlov Stog again and uh, looking at sounding a bell and salivating and so on. There's nothing to say we couldn't use a more cognitive approach in addition to that to understand why is it that the, the dog salivates. Uh, the dog is obviously retaining uh, information in memory and the recall of that information must be uh, must be clear at least to the dog that when he or she hears the bell that food is about to arrive so the two approaches of the behaviorist and the uh, cognitive approach they're not mutually exclusive they're, they're not uh, they can be run together now disadvantages, well, it ignores biological processes, for example the state of health. Um, it's assumed that, broadly speaking, that uh, experiences are gained and then put into memory and analyzed and internalized and then brought back from memory when appropriate. Um, people may have experiences and have had fairly traumatic experiences uh, which they find difficult to bring back. These are experiences that they want to shut out, to close off and uh, so not all experiences are positive. Some experiences might be bad or, or also the person may be experiencing health issues, broader health issues which colors the way they see the experiences and gives them a particular interpretation which is not accurate on the experience. And cognitive experiments can be subjective and difficult to analyze. For example, the um, psychometric testing uh, processes, well they're not that clear-cut. Uh, they, they they have got faults and they may be interpreted in different ways so that the scientific approach that we talk about is not that clear. It's, it's not easy to get um, a definitive picture of how people think or how people behave. People are much more complex so that some degree of subjectivity creeps into the, the whole process and, and that makes it difficult. 
At a conclusion, well, over the years cognitive theory has gained a wider importance compared to behaviourism. Uh, behaviourism um, analyses the external being, whereas cognitivism deals with the internal processing of information. And that's probably quite a good way of looking at the differences. Uh, behaviourism looks at the the dog hears the, the bell, the stimulus, and as a response gets food, and the dog becomes conditioned. So we just look from the outside at what happens. It's it's conditioning. We are not involved in the way the, the dog thinks about the situation, or what the dog understands, or how the dog has filed this away in memory, or we're, we're not interested in that sense in, in the cognitive processes. We're looking at the the more explicit approaches. We, we see what's happening. We hear the bell, we see the dog salivating, we see the dog getting fed. So we see the stimulus, the response and the positive reinforcement. The dog actually gets the, the nice food to eat, which means the next time the dog hears the bell, the dog will salivate again. But with the cognitive, we try to get inside the mind to try and figure out what is actually happening. So the, the main focus of the theory is based on how we receive, construct and implement information. So it's, it's much more internal. Unlike behavioralism, uh, cognitive theory uses techniques to understand and improve memory look at also problem solving and any ways of aiding in the learning process. So it's it's trying to relate to the way we think, what's in our heads, and trying to bring about situations which facilitate our uh, knowledge acquisition and facilitate the way we understand experiences and get the proper interpretation an accurate uh, interpretation of the experiences and then be able to recall them in the right situation in the future. There are some of the sources that uh, we mentioned uh, in the, the course of this talk and that's all I'm going to do for the moment on this one so I'm going to leave it there and say thank you for watching.